fire. That's the reason why, as we look at the atonement today, we're not just looking at healing. Healing, uh, we can deal without that today. We can, but we cannot deal without salvation and without holiness, because it says, "Follow peace with God and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord." A person can, can get healed and not see the Lord eventually if he's not free from sin, if he's not saved, if he's not cleansed, if he's not sanctified, if he's not holy unto the Lord. Redemption for all through the atonement of Christ. That's what we are looking at today in the Word of God. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the redemptive atonement of Christ for all people. Number two is the regenerative atonement at Calvary for our propitiation. And then number three, we have the restorative atonement on the cross for true partakers. Look at number one. Number one is the redemptive atonement of Christ for all people in Leviticus chapter 17. Reading here from verse 11. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. To make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh, that maketh, it made, it makes, it will make until the time of the coming of the Lord. When the door of salvation will be closed to everyone, it says, it maketh an atonement for the soul. Again, we come back to Romans chapter 5. I was looking at verse 8 very uh, definitely now, for God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, God commendeth his love to us. While we were yet sinners, not while we were sick, not while we had problems of money, of finance, of uh, prosperity, poverty, he looked at us as sinners and he knew of all the things that happen to us in life. Sin is the most deadly, is the most dangerous, is the one, is the thing that will cast us away from his presence forever and ever. And it says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then in verse 9, it says much more than being justified, not just healed, justified. The essence of the atonement of Christ is that he wants to bring us justification. He wants to bring us reconciliation with God. He says much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved. Not, it's not talking about healing. For the atonement, it says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Then in verse 10, it says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Then in verse 11, it says in verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now. You see, the atonement is effective now on this earth. Some people say you can't know who will be saved until you get over there, heaven. No, it says that now we have received 
the atonement. Look at this redemptive atonement of Christ, and we divide that to three parts. Number one, the complete atonement for all people. Complete, satisfactory, and sufficient that anyone on earth, on the planet earth, anyone can have the effect and the result of that atonement now, the complete atonement for all people. Number two is the confirmed atonement for the penitent. It's for everybody, like the river, like the water in the ocean, it's for everybody. No discrimination, but is the one that takes his cup there, and bends down and take of that water that will refresh his personal life. Atonement for everyone, atonement for all people. But it is the penitent, it is the repentant, it's the one that comes in faith to the Lord that actually has the benefit of the atonement confirmed in his personal life. Number three is the concrete assurance of our pardon. When you come and you turn away from sin, and you repent of your sin, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the final sacrifice, and our substitute, then that pardon coming through the atonement becomes yours. Look at number one. Number one is the complete atonement for all people. We're coming to Leviticus 17 again, and in verse 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have, God has given it to us, everyone, no discrimination upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. In Isaiah chapter 53, looking at it from verse 4, Isaiah chapter 53, and we're looking at verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted in verse 5, he says in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, first of all before you think of why he was wounded number one, the central thing the important thing, the essential thing, uh, the indispensable experience we to have is total forgiveness and total freedom from our transgression because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him before you come to with the stripes where he, look at verse 6 in verse 6 it says all we, like sheep, have gone astray. That's uh, retreating and repeating, emphasizing the fact that all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. And if there's anything we need to think about, we should think of God who has been grieved by our iniquity, rather than thinking about the pain we have. Many people center every consideration on themselves. I'm sick, I feel the pain. God is grieved by our sin. God is pained by our transgression. And the first thing that you concern us is that we come short of the glory of God. And because we come short of the glory of God, it pains us to the marrow that we have offended God. Our own, who are we? Who are we? Out of uh, 8 billion people on earth, you are thinking of just one man, just one woman there. We think of the God of creation, that his creation has abandoned, that his creation has offended, that his creation has transgressed, and we think of the pain of 
God who sent his only begotten son into the world. And the world is not looking in the direction of the one who has sacrificed his only begotten son. Our greatest concern as people who are believers is that the world is offensive against God. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The atonement has been made by Christ. And it is for everyone. And yet, we would say more than 90% of the world has not known. And they have not reconciled unto God. That gives us concern that the Lord has made the atonement and not many people have received, have accepted, have believed that atonement. It tells us in John chapter 1 verse 29, it says, the next day John said, Jesus come in unto him and says, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He made the atonement for the whole world, but the whole world has not known. And so we want to abandon and forget our own petty, petty, small uh, concerns and think about the world that should have got knowledge about the atonement. And then we take the gospel of the mercy of God for reconciliation unto them. We're looking at number two here. Number two here is the concrete, is the, is the confirmed atonement for the penitent. The confirmed atonement for the penitent. It tells us in John chapter 3 verse 16. It says, for God loved, for God so loved the world. Again, the world, the whole world, the atonement, the sacrifice, the shedding of the blood of Christ for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son the most precious that he can look at and pick in heaven. None of the angels uh, are equal to the Christ that came. All the angels together in their totality, they're not equal to the only begotten son. God could have sacrificed an angel without blinking an eye. He could have sacrificed all those angels together because they're creatures, they're created beings. He could have created all the angels if he want to, but if he wanted to, but he took the greatest in heaven. He took his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes. The atonement is for the whole world, but the benefit of that atonement is for whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If that is what the only thing that the sinner reads, he'll say, well, it doesn't matter what I do because God has not sent his son into the world to condemn the world. If that's the only thing, the backslider, the one who is sinning against God, after he had known of the atonement of the Lord, if that verse is the only one you read, you'll say, well, we backslide, but you know, God doesn't mind because he has not sent his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The problem of many people, churchgoers, is that they read one verse, they don't read the next verse. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but 
he that believeth not is condemned already. The one who does not believe in the atonement, that the atonement is for him. The one who does not believe that the blood of the atonement can cleanse him from all sin. The one who does not believe in the power of the blood of the Lamb to make us clean and make us free, he that believeth not is condemned already. If he is condemned already, and he continues in that unbelief until the end of his life, he'll be condemned forever. He's condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And then he tells us in verse 19, in verse 19, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. But a man loved their darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And when you look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 20, I'm just emphasizing to everyone that you need to be penitent, you need to be, you need to regret for your, the sin you have committed. You need to have remorse, sorrow, sorrow apart for the sin you have committed so that that sorrow, the sorrow for sin will lead you to repentance, conviction leading to conversion. It tells us in Acts chapter 20 verse 20, it says, and now, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, and I have taught you publicly and from house to house. Was he teaching? What has he taught? Verse 21. In verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. We cannot say, okay, he's made the atonement. Everybody can come in, he says, he teaches, and we teach, and the Bible teaches, and everyone ought to teach repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in First John chapter 5, and I read here from verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Those who have hated their sin, they have detested their sinfulness, they have regretted every sin they ever committed in their lives, and they don't take joy, they don't brag about uh, all the evil things and the sinful things they did in transgressing against the Lord. They don't come before the Lord and uh, say, you know, I used to have good days. I used to drink, I used to do that, womanize and do all that. And I remember all those things that I did when I was playing all those pranks. No. When you are born again, you know that it was a dirty life you lived in the past. It was a sorrowful life you lived in the past. And now that you are born again, it says we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself that, that wicked one Toucheth him not. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. Would you believe there are some people who say they believe in Christ, that they are children of God, they're expecting the coming of the Lord, they don't evangelize. You know why? In their doctrine, they believe that the whole world universally will eventually be saved. You say why? They say because he had, the Lord had already provided the atonement for the whole world. And they say the atonement of Christ cannot fail. That 
God has ordained that the whole world be atoned for. And because of that, whether we preach to them or we don't preach to them, they are saved. Look at this verse. We know that we are of God. Why? Because we believe, because we have repented. And then we know that the whole world, those who have not believed, they lie in wickedness. And if they are not saved, if they don't come out of that wickedness, that atonement will not avail for them because they have not given themselves in repentance and faith unto the Lord. And we're coming to number three here. Number three is the concrete assurance for our pardon. The concrete assurance for our pardon. In John chapter 8, reading from verse 9, and they which had each being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one. Those were the Pharisees, beginning at the elders, even unto the last. And uh, Jesus was led alone, and the woman, the woman they caught in adultery that they brought to Christ, and they said, Moses said, we shall stone a woman like this. What sayest thou? And he said, he that has no sin among you, pick up the the first stone, understand, understand, Christ made atonement for even the Pharisees, for the whole world. But the Pharisees were not saved. They were not cleansed from their sinfulness because they closed their eyes. They stopped their ears that they will not hear the word of repentance, of redemption, of reconciliation. And because of that, he told them, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And these people, they went out one by one, and then they left the woman standing in the midst. In verse 10, verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw.